From my childhood, I was the youngest of four, two boys and two girls, and it was pretty happy. I was a happy child um, for the most part um, until um, when I was about seven, um, I was sexually abused by a family member. And I can remember f feeling a sense of loss of myself and having to hide uh, that secret, having to keep that secret. Um, it just sort of deadened my personality, really. Um, so I struggled with that for a while, and in, in hiding it, um, I sort of adopted, you know, all these sort of erratic and irrational behaviours. Um, and I think, looking back, the beginning of uh, a self-loathing that I wasn't aware of at the time. Well, I was really just so judgmental. I think probably I suspected everybody around me of being sort of a monster um, and I became a monster too really. I had a, sort of a lot of aggression and I thought well no one's going to ever you know do that to me again. So I became really aggressive and nasty really. You know I was very good at um, sort of putting people down with my mouth. I was very quick and I actually enjoyed it. It gave me a sense of power which I think I'd lost. Um, so that was the beginning of me really starting to sort of not like myself as a person um, through my teenage years, um, my early 20s. Uh, I looked for love in all the wrong places like a lot of people do. I know that's a cliche but I so did that. I was so um, sort of looking for love, I suppose, um, but I was very, very, um, what's the word, uh, easy, but that's not what I'm looking for. Um, I sort of had no respect for myself. It was just trying to fill this emptiness or this, this gap with, I don't know what, attention from the opposite sex and things like that. So. Uh, promiscuous, that's the word. I was very <laughs> promiscuous, but never getting any satisfaction or feeling that it was getting me what I wanted. So um, I soon got sort of fed up with that and started using drugs to numb everything. I thought I'd stop trying to feel things altogether. So, you know, I got into drinking, using drugs. I'd take anything really, um, except heroin. I tried that and I didn't like it. Um, for, so for a lot of years, I sort of just went between being high, having sex. I got pregnant a few times. Um, I've got two sons, but I probably should have about 10 children, I think, if I hadn't murdered them all. Um, and uh, that was my life for a really long time. My mum died when I was 16, 17. I started drinking pretty much straight away, really. I started using cocaine. I mean, I started using puff, sorry, and drinking. Um, that was okay for a while, but you can only smoke and drink so much before you wanna lie down and go to sleep. So I started using cocaine. I found cocaine suited my personality a bit more because it allowed me to be more sort of gregarious. It seemed like it was the perfect drug for me. So um, I'd use that a lot, um, pretty much all the time. Um, but again, it was the same empty feeling afterwards. After a little while, um, it was the same empty feeling of just that void. You know, it was like I couldn't numb it. Um, so then I tried crack cocaine. Um, as a member of my family introduced me to crack cocaine. And that, I was pretty much um, hook, line and sinker on the crack cocaine. Um, unfortunately, you know, you can't be a good mother when you're out of your, off your face on drugs. So that was another nail in my coffin, as it were, because um, I sort of got into a cycle of thinking, oh, I'm a bad mother. So then I'd use more drugs. It was like, oh, I'm a bad mother because this happened to me and that happened to me. And I'd use more drugs to try and numb it. And then I'd feel bad again and it was just never-ending cycle. I was getting suicidal thoughts and um, 
my drug, I was calling my drug dealer and, and you know, saying, you know, you've got to come now. I was calling him at really crazy hours and stuff. So I suppose he must have realised, um, you know, that my behaviour had changed. Although I, he, had, he never said anything to me, but because I used to go out with this guy anyway, um, you know, I used to get drugs for free pretty much most of the time. So I thought, oh, I'll just stop passing drugs and sort of top myself. So one day I'd rang him, told him to come round, and uh, he came round, and he said, he, I, I, I sort of opened the door a little, a little clink, and um, you know he was standing there, and I said, oh yeah, come in. He said, oh no, you've got to come with me, and I was like, no, I'm not going out. I'm not dressed, you know, to go out. And he said, it's all right, it's all right. Just stick your shoes on, and um, you know, put your cardi on and just come with me, you've got to come with me and see something. So I said, okay. So I thought, oh, he's probably got like some new strain of crack or some new, you know, smoke or something new that he wants, wants, to, wants, me to, wants to share with me, wants me to try. Because, um, you know, he had done that before. So I was sort of thinking, oh, this will be good. I'll get one last mad high before I kill myself. <laughs> so that's exactly what I was thinking as I was throwing on my clothes. So um, anyway, I went with him, got downstairs, got in the car. I said, so, you know, what is it? And he said, oh, just wait and see, just wait and see. I said, OK. Um, and I said, you know, well, have you got anything now? Can I take anything now? And uh, he gave me a smoke. So I was sitting in the car and I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, this is so exciting. And uh, I was so wrapped up in my mind of imagining what, we were take what I was going to be taking and what was going to happen. Um, I didn't notice that he'd driven me to the hospital to the A and E in the um, psych, psych, psychiatric department. So we've got there, and I thought this is a hospital. So I thought, oh my gosh, it must be some like serious drugs, like if they're using them in the hospital. So um, I'm still excited, none the wiser. And um, he's walked in there with me, and he's gone to the woman at the desk. This this woman needs some help. Needs your help. And I was like. No, I don't. What are you talking about? And he said, look, you need to be here. So, you know, and he literally got someone to come and talk to me, um, a psychiatrist. And from there, uh, it was like my world came crashing down, even though it seemed like my world was, was already at an end. But it was like this sort of dream that I was in just came to an end and the ugly reality was there and suddenly drugs was the last thing on my mind. It was just, I don't know, it was just a really strange um, sensation of one part of me was sort of going, yay, finally, maybe I'm going to get well. And another part of me was just terrified, terrified, terrified of having to, you know, deal with myself without any medication you know any anything to numb numb my brain stop my brain from functioning or just numb my emotions it got really bad to the point of you know my kids were living on beans and cereal and my first um priority was to get crack crack cocaine yeah uh, i was living without electricity for a short period of time um and it all came to a head one day uh, when I met this guy and I went to a clinic and I got a diagnosis that pulled me up short. Um, I got diagnosed with HIV and um, pretty much from then things started to change. Well, when I was told I had HIV, I immediately thought it's a death, death sentence. I thought, oh, I'm going to die tomorrow. And I just re took a long look at my myself and my life and I thought, what, what are my kids going to think when I'm gone? Because I remember thinking about my mum when she passed and the thoughts that I had. I thought, my kids are going to think, oh, you know, I'm glad she's gone. And that really bothered me. And um, I forgot to say, actually, that when I was 16, before my mum died, I went to church with her and I gave my life to the Lord. I forgot to mention that. It's quite important. Um, so it was like I suddenly remembered that I was saved and that God loved me and that he would forgive me. And so I just repented of everything that I, where I was at that point. I just said, 
God, you know, I just said, Jesus, I need your help. I need you to take me back and fix this mess that I've made of my life and my children's life. Um, and it's funny because I, I was just starting to go to therapy just before this start, this happened. And maybe just two weeks or something before I found out about the HIV, I'd started to go into therapy. And uh, there was this woman there who was like really bubbly and overexcited. And I got on well, well with her straight away. And um, she said, she kept saying to me, oh, um, you should come with me to um, my church because doing, they're doing a course there because we were talking about the course that we were doing um, and how it was helping us to deal with our stuff. And she said, oh, I do this other course. So I said, she said, I said, well, what is it? She said, it's the 12 steps. I said, oh, I don't need to do that. I'm off drugs and everything now. Um, I said, I, you know, I did it all by myself. And she said, OK. And then she saw me the next week and she said, you know what? I really think that you should come to this place. I said, no. Nah. And every time I saw her, she, you know, we'd meet for coffee and stuff because we got on really well. And she was the only friend I had at that time because I'd, you know, I'd lost all my friends and sort of family before that through using drugs and, you know, just ripping people off, being horrible. Um, so I was quite on my own. And um, she said, no, 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 I really feel that you should come. She goes, look, just come one time. She said, after that, I won't ever mention it again. So I thought, oh, I'll just go just to shut her up because, you know, she's getting really annoying. So um, little did I know that um, she was taking me to the recovery course. Um, the 12 steps was in line with um, biblical teaching. And that was unexpected. And even though I thought I didn't need it, the first time I was there, I just sobbed the whole way through. I couldn't speak, I couldn't move, because I kept saying, get up, get up and get out, get up and get out. I couldn't move off my seat. I was just, just buckets of tears coming. And um, Nigel was just, just giving the introduction to the, to the thing, you know, we hadn't even got into anything yet. And I was just sobbing my heart out. And um, I remember taking uh, some of the, 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 the paperwork home the first night and looking at it and just feeling a sense of relief just coming over me because it was like, if I can remember the feeling right, it was like God was saying to me, look, this is a tool that is going to bring me, help you to come closer to me. And it was like, it gave me the platform to face things that I couldn't face, things that I couldn't put into words even, you know, not that I didn't want to face them, but I just didn't have any understanding of where I was spiritually or even naturally, you know, my head was just so shredded. Um, and it just brought things into focus, the important things, um, which was God wanting to heal me. The Lord taught me that I can love myself as the person that he sees me as. So my journey now is just recognizing that what God says about me is true. It's not because of anything I can do. I can never, it's not like I've changed me as a person. It's like I'm still the same, but my habits are different because my beliefs about who he says I am have changed. You know, I had very negative thoughts about myself before, but since I've properly committed to walking with the Lord, um, he's shown me who I am through his eyes and I like that person and I like, you know, that's the relationship that I'm thriving in now. Remembering the way I was when I, the first, the first day that I walked into um, that hall to do the recovery course the first time. The person I am now compared to that person, there is no comparison apart from what you see on the outside. And obviously I'm a bit fatter now. But um, it's, it's really hard for me to think back and remember that person, even though I can remember how broken and how scared and how just lost, no sense of self-worth or, you know, just this pointless person really, who just created a lot of mayhem, mayhem and damage and now, 
I've learned so much through doing the recovery course. It was do, through working the steps, I was able to face a lot of things that had brought me to that point of being becoming that shell of a person. And, you know, with God's help, I've sort of been able to exercise things and God's healed me in other areas and I've sort of grown and learned to believe other things, what God says about me and I've just, you know, I mean, I'm still going now. I'm still, you know, there are still things that um, crop up every now and again and I think, oh, you know, that's something that needs to, you know, be looked at and dealt with rather than hidden and covered up. So um, it's been so invaluable to me to do that course. And, and I mean, this is someone who thought she didn't need the course. I, I wasn't taking any drugs at that time. You know, I thought I could do it on my own. Um, but no, it's, it's helped me to heal so much and it's still working with me. It's still working for me today. From day one, it was just healing, healing, healing. A lot of repentance, a lot of me going, oh my God, that was terrible, did I really do that? And, you know, even sometimes today, I, you know, I'm going, oh, my God, did I just do that? Did I just say that? But, um, yeah, it, the recovery course was, it's one of the, it is one of the best things I, I ever, have ever done in my, in my adult life, definitely, because it's still, it still works for me today, you know. It's uh, my walk with Jesus has happened because I was able to face things um, which, you know, the, recover, the recovery course brought up.